if you notice when a snake wants to strike, he curls back his neck a little bit. So he's got that kind of S shape. That's an attempt to camouflage with how far I can strike. He can strike a little bit longer than you would initially think based on where he is. Same kind of thing for me as a tackler. My strike distance is gonna be a little bit further than you think as a ball carrier. You think, oh, I, I got this dude set up. He's too far away. He stopped his feet. Bang. Welcome back into another exciting edition of That's Your Mama, the going down version of it on Coming to America. That's right, coming to us now. This is Up On Game Presents Conversations with a Legend. And unlike going down with your mama and coming to America, well, you were going down, but you were a quarterback most likely. You were getting sacked by this next guest that I had, the great Chad Brown. What's happening, brother? What's happening, man? It's, uh, you know, this doing this with you is one of those full circle experiences. Uh, met you way back uh, in the days in the 90s when you were in high school up in uh, North Hills, uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, met you at, uh, what was it, 24-Hour Fitness? It was uh, Bally's. Bally's, there we go. Yes, back it in the day Bally's. in Pittsburgh. Let me, let, let me set the stage here. So my dad, my dad was like dope dude, like always, you know, had me exposed to what I could be what I felt I could be, what I thought I should be. And then he had a way of proving to you that what you wanted was obtainable, but it was going to take a ton of work. So I was working out and he was like, well, I go to this, this sports sports spot. It's called Bally's. It's out, uh, it's out where the, the, uh, the movie theater is. I'm going to take you there and we're going to get some work in. And I was like, all right, we're going to go. But I'll be working hard at the high school. But he was like, adamant, you got to come here. So I come up in there and I get up off of the bench. And this was like a scene out of like a mutant movie. Like I look up and it's like, boom, there's Greg Lloyd right there on the treadmill with his shirt off. And the rules said, don't have your shirt off. And and he's got his shirt off. And they're trying to figure out how to tell 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 Greg to put his shirt back on. Bam! I look over here on the bike in 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 the uh in the cardio area, and Chad Brown is sitting there pedaling and and reading the magazine. And I looked at my dad. I was like, "That's why you brought me here, huh?" He was he started laughing. He said, "If you gonna work like a great, then you need to see how the greats work." I never understood. I was always in the weighted area. Y'all were always doing cardio, man. I didn't learn it until I got older that it was all about the anaerobic muscle, the muscle being able to, to continue on and keep going and the flexibility of it and the mobility of it, not the... <laughs> so I started learning it. And I realized all those times I saw y'all in the cardio area, it was really more about the cardio and, and building your wind up and being able to maintain that speed during the duration of what you were doing. I learned a lot from y'all, man. It was like one of the super, super coolest moments of my life was being in there with, with the, the 2.0 steel curtain. So shots out to that because very... There's very few stories that I have that were so formative to me, transformative. It transformed my whole trajectory because I, I just felt like I was destined to be one of y'all. Like, that was my thing. So, anyway, I appreciate you coming into the show. Obviously, anytime I get a linebacker in from, from linebacker, uh, uh, profession line, linebacker, pro, uh, that's that's a, a beautiful thing for me. That's why I rock my linebacker you because you know I, we got a linebacker from from the league. Um, you guys probably are the greatest assembly of linebackers ever in the history of of the game, Brown. And some may may debate you know the 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 Falcons when they had Swilling and Tuggle and those guys. 
I I don't I don't really think that that there's any disputing you, Levon Kirkland, Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green. I don't I don't think there's a debate. What say you when you think about in the annals of the game that you guys actually, even if you feel like it's just a discussion. You guys are the greatest linebacking core ever in the history of of the National Football League. Uh, wow, that is a that's a big statement you just made. Um, I appreciate the kind words. Um, NFL Films has our group, Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, Lamont Kirkland, and myself as the seventh best linebacker crew of all time. Uh, because I, I think that the limiting factor for us is we were really only together for three years. Um, after my third year. Kevin Green left. Uh, in my fourth year, Greg Lloyd tears an ACL. I ended up moving to outside linebacker. Right, I remember. So it was just a small window that we were together. The Steelers at the time were one of the um, less wealthy franchises in the league. The yeah. old Free River Stadium didn't have luxury boxes. So uh, the salary cap constraints that the Steelers were under were pretty tight. Um, so they couldn't keep us together for very long. And in fact, I left after year four and, you know, I've run into, you know, the Rooney family over the years, so many different places and times. And the, you know, first part of the conversation is always, I wish we could have found a way to keep you. I wish we had been in the new stadium. We would have had enough money to keep you. We just couldn't keep pace with that Paul Allen money that the Seahawks were offering. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think we had the potential to be the greatest linebacker crew of all time. But that three-year window wasn't long enough. It had been five or six years. Yeah, I, I think we would be, would be legitimately in that conversation. Um, if you take me and LaVon from where we were in our youth when we were both with Kevin and take it five years down the road when LaVon and I were both in our primes, yes, Greg Lloyd in his prime, Kevin Gro uh, Green in his prime, Chad Brown in his prime, and LaVon Kirkland in his prime, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that we are the greatest linebacker crew of all time, but we weren't, the timing wasn't perfect. We were all able to be together for that long a period of time. Yeah, that, that sounds good. That, and, and, you know, in some annals, maybe that makes sense, but <laughs> that, that's not, you know, that's not even really up for debate. Um, I, I mean, when you think about the relevance of what you guys did, you're, you're the master of the spin rush technique nobody was doing that you were you were the originator of it you perfected it the spin was the spin and and you were like largely in part considered to be a small inside backer considering that you was next to a, a three technique that was was playing <laughs> playing at the middle position and then you think about g lloyd was considered to be undersized as well and and Kevin Green was like one of those prototype rush defensive end slash outside back, you know, linebackers. Um, I don't I don't think there's any debating that. I mean, you can look at, you know, some of the other like I said, you know, they may have put the, the Ravens the in the what the 2000 Ravens on there or something like that. I don't I don't know what I do know is football. And that collection, uh, and then you had y'all were so good, y'all had Gildan on the sideline, like he's watching. So y'all had one in the hole. Y'all were so good when when y'all were there. But anyway, I digress. This this isn't about um just football. The one thing that I love about doing conversations with a legend is having conversations about us as people what we're doing now in life, you know, what, what our aspirations are, what, what they've been, the things that we've overcome. You had an interesting journey to, to the league. Now I live out in, in LA and I coach out here. I coached in Pasadena for, for a time. Mm -hmm. And one of the legendary tales that always came up was the stories of Chad Brown when he was at John Muir High School. And it's still, to this day, they talk about the McCulloughs. They talk about Chad Brown. Uh, obviously, they bring up uh, uh, Holmes. They bring up uh, Derek Darnay. Holmes. They bring up Darnay. Darnay, yep. Darnay and Derek. Uh, and Pop Derek, yep. yep. And, and, and so it, it's, it's interesting to 
to be here and someone who impacted me all the way across the coast, the country in Pittsburgh is such a legend here in Southern California. Just talk to me a little bit about what what that journey was like because Pasadena, uh, if people if people pay attention, is a very very wealthy old money area in some places, <laughs> in some places, and others is straight up the birthplace of Bloods and that Pyru love and all that stuff. And there's a lot of intermingling, mixing going on between the two communities, which it made it make sense as to why police were aggressive at times and and did different things because it's like, here's here's basically a rough project neighborhood and, and literally walking distance, you're away from three, four million dollar homes. And, and it was just an interesting dichotomy in which you seemingly grew up in. What what was that like? You know what? Uh, I, I think a lot of us look at our, our childhoods and maybe have a little bit of a charmed view of it sometimes. Uh, but it was exactly as you described. There, there definitely was some uh, income disparity. Um, even within my high school, John Muir High School, you know, there were kids who had SAT, SAT tutors who got perfect scores on the SATs who were going to some Ivy League schools. And meanwhile, there were some, you know, kids from the you know, more hood areas of Pasadena who had a very different outlook and upbringing and a, you know, pros- prospects for life. So uh, in some ways, it was actually perfect because to grow up, uh, you know, hungry and poor and be able to go a couple of blocks away from my house and see what my hard work can potentially give me you know, uh, I've been watching The Wire. Um, I, you know, I, I never watched it when it was first coming out. I've done a deep dive and been doing a binge watch the last couple of weeks. And all those kids on The Wire, they know nothing but that little slice of Baltimore and their couple of blocks. And there's no vision for them of their future. But I could walk a couple of blocks and I could see what my future could be. Uh, let's not forget that uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, NASA, all that is in Pasadena as well. So I went to school with kids and was in classes with kids whose parents were engineers at NASA and were program directors at NASA. So greatness was around, maybe not in my particular neighborhood, but I could see it. So the ability to be you know, one of the boys in the hood and do all that stuff and, and, and have that drive for athletic greatness was always there because there's an amazing athletic tradition in the city of Pasadena. Jackie Robinson was a John Muir Mustang. Uh, Ricky Irvin's Roll Bowl MVP was a John Muir Mustang, former Washington Redskin. Uh, Stacey Ogma, NBA great. Jock Vaughn, NBA great. So there's all this great athletic tradition, and you mentioned some of the football names as well earlier, but at the same time, there's also this separate community that was always kind of the carrots out there for guys like myself of if I'm able to get this thing going and do the number of right things, I can be one of those people whose house is, is above the hills looking down at the Rose Bowl. My high school, John Muir High School, is about a mile from the Rose Bowl. And sometimes during uh, training camp, we would have to run from the practice fields to the Rose Bowl, touch the fence at the Rose Bowl, and come back. So we would see those homes that surround the Rose Bowl. You would run by those homes and think, one day this can be me. So my vision wasn't limited to just to the couple of blocks where I was. So it was a perfect situation of athletic prowess, amazing talent, um, the hunger for to change my personal situation, but also to see what my success can bring. And there is a life outside of this couple block hood where I'm growing up in. That's awesome, man. That's so, so being motivated, inspired by the likes of the people that you're speaking of during that time, what outside of that motivation when you took it to to the field was that was that the plan is i can do it through through football or how what was that 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 motivating factor that drove you to play the game the way that you did was it the tradition of it was it the possibilities of what it could provide like what 
Well, playing Pop Warner football um, with the particular time frame that I was in Pop Warner football, I played with seven NFL players in Pop Warner football. You know, like nine or 10 scholarship athletes in Pop Warner football. So part of it is you're just trying to get on the field and compete with these guys every day, whether it's actual Pop Warner football or we're playing a pickup game at the park or whatever the case may be. I just want to raise my level to be with these guys. And I grew up in a neighborhood where I was one of the younger guys. So for me, I had to be tough. I had to be a little bit more mature past my years just for them to let me play because I couldn't, I couldn't cry. I couldn't whine about it. You know, you get blasted, get back up and keep playing. Otherwise, you will not be able to play tomorrow. So just simply the environment, the kids I was around helped me raise my level of my game. Then I get to John Muir High School. And again, I spoke about the athletic tradition there. So when you walk the halls of John Muir High School and you see images of greatness on the walls, um, there's a reason why we put pictures of greatness inside of football facilities to remind all the players about what, what they are walking into. When I became a Pittsburgh Steeler, there's the Lombardi trophies there. There's, you know, there's Jack Ham walking into the locker room. You're reminded constantly of the greatness. John Muir High School, the same thing. This is a proud tradition that you are now lucky to be a part of, and you need to uphold your end of that. So not only am I walking into a place with an incredible tradition, but all those guys who I played Pop Warner football with are now part of this same high school football team. Uh, we ended up winning 32 games in a row. We were incredible. So the expectations and the standards were very high. And then I recognized that, yeah, I think of myself as a smart dude, but at the same time, I wasn't some incredibly gifted student. So my chances for college were going to be based on what I did on that field. Um, so that quickly began to seize the opportunity. My high school coach, uh, Coach Brownfield, is now part of the Calif Southern California Coaches Hall of Fame or something like that. Um, he sat down with my parents before my junior year and said, if you get Chad to take care of the academics on your side, I'll take care of the athletics on my side and Chad will get a college scholarship. My parents didn't tell me about that meeting for almost a year. Um, and once they finally, you know, ha had a conversation with me about that meeting, that was all that I needed to do to turn my game up even more. Because it's one thing when you are laying in your bed and you're looking at Sports Illustrated and you got your own hopes and dreams. But when someone else starts to believe in you and see something in you that you don't necessarily see in yourself beyond just a hope and a dream, but they see a, a reality and a, and a path to that reality, man, that was it for me. If Coach Brownfield believes in me, then I can actually go out there and achieve it. So mom and dad talk to you about the academics. Coach talks to you about the academic. Well, at least they talk about the whole thing. You end up at Colorado. You, you end up being a Buffalo. And, and that was when Colorado was, well, Colorado. Uh, they played some football back then. Uh, what was, what was that like? You, you turning on the gas to get the grades and to get yourself to a point of where your play could get you to that next level. How did that feel knowing that you were able to do it? Like I, I did this now I'm, I'm at a major college and I'm one step away from being able to get that home that I'm running by touching the gate at, at the Rose bowl. Like, what did that feel like? What, what was that? Did that turn up the mentality even more? Did it, did it just even you out? Like, how did that make Chad Brown feel? You get to the university of Colorado and to your point, we were at the tops of college football back then you were in your linebacker, you shirt. There was a point in time when I was in the NFL shortly after I finished at Colorado, there were more Colorado linebackers in the NFL than any other college. Obviously, things have changed. But for a while, we prided ourselves on, on that, stealing that title back from, from you guys. Um, but the experience at Colorado, again, another one of those super charmed experiences. I go to Colorado exactly the right time. They are plucking the best players from Southern California and getting Eric Bieniemy and J.J. Flanagan and Darian Hagan and going to Texas and getting Alfred Williams and going to Louisiana and getting Cordell Stewart. So they are plucking the best players from the 
the best athletic uh, cities and towns in the country. So our practices, I'm going against, you know, future all pros in practice. I'm going against future pro bowlers in practice. So that experience, there was uh, that confidence building that I got a shot at the next level. If I'm able to make all big eight and beat out this teammate for a starting job, then there's an opportunity for me in the NFL. So over the five years, I registered in my first year, played the five years. Um, it, every year was a, a, another step of physical maturity, another step of, of confidence, and another step of belief in myself. And this belief wasn't, again, it wasn't the hopes and, and dreams of, of a kid laying in his bed. It was met with the reality of, I went out to practice and I knocked the crap out of Eric Bieniemy. I went out to practice and I'm competing with Alfred Williams who's a all American and a buckets award winner and every drill that we do. So it's, it's, there, there's a, there's a, a reality of, uh, to this whole thing. There's a base of, of strength and solidness to this belief that is based on the work that's going on on the field. So um, I wasn't necessarily making plans to buy a multi-million dollar house and, and all that, but I was certainly thinking about, I've got a shot here to take myself to the next level um, and again, that, 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 that shot is, is backed up by the confidence of the work that I do on the field and the results that show themselves up when, every time they put film up on the board. Oh, man. So you guys were loaded back then. You're, you're in school, you're working your way through. How would life have been if there was an NIL or a transfer portal. Do you think that your development and your idea of how things went would have been the same? Would you have dealt with the same things? Would you have had the same focuses? It seems to be now that the NIL and the transfer portal is warping you know, the idea of what struggle looks like. It's warping what maybe the focus of what building your career should look like. While I'm a proponent of it, I would have loved to have had an NIL when, when I was in school. Um, but I would have never, I would have never felt as though I needed to use the transfer portal unless it literally was, the last resort opportunity, meaning this guy is beating me out. We're the same year. I have no more years of eligibility when he leaves. And it doesn't seem like I'm going, I'm going to get it. Maybe I look to a different school, but even then I don't know that my pride would allow me to walk away from the challenge of at some point, I'm going to beat this dude out. What would it have been like for you, just on your recollection of how it was being able to make money off of your name, your image, and likeness while you were in school? And how would you have handled things if at any point in time you had one time where you could say, I'm up, I'm going to go somewhere else? Well, the transfer portal and the NIL conversation, um, we could fill up 10 shows because there's just so much that goes into that. Let me just say, do I think players should be compensated in some way for what they contribute to the school and the bottom line of the university? Absolutely. Is this wild, wild west thing that's going on right now where guys are signing multi-million model deals when they're in, in it's, things are a little wild. There needs to be some guardrails and some parameters put in place. I'm happy the players are being paid, but we've disrupted the entire system as you and I experienced it. And to your point, I would think almost every college athlete at some point has a phone call back home to mom or dad about how they want to leave or they want to go someplace else. And a lot of that just could be chalked up to immaturity and, you know, not understanding how to overcome challenges. Um, I had that conversation with my dad and I was like, I'm going to go back home and I'm going to go to Pasadena City College and I'm going to transfer to some other school. And he was like, no, you're not. You, 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 you can come home, but you, you can't stay here because your home is the University of Colorado. You've got a tremendous opportunity in front of you. And just because you are facing some challenges 
it is not time to turn and run because your challenges are still going to follow you pretty much wherever you go. You may find a better playing situation for yourself, but you are not going to be able to escape the challenges that life presents you. Those are your battles to fight. And they don't change when you transfer and go to a different school. Um, so I think the transfer portal is great. My radio partner, I got a daily radio show in Denver, is Nate Jackson, end up playing receiver for the Denver Broncos. He was at a Division three school, and he was cut from the Division three football team. So he had to transfer to pursue his dreams. So the transfer portal does have a place. You get to some school and, I don't know, the coach's son is the quarterback and you got no shot to get on the field. Only one quarterback plays at a time. It ain't like linebackers, three or four of us, and we rotate. So there's a place for the transfer portal. But I think we've enabled kids now to try to run away from the challenges and they don't have that dig deep in, uh, th that we were forced to do. I wasn't going to sit out a year. That was not simply an option for me. So I had to find a way to beat out Terry Johnson, my freshman year. And Terry and I ended up splitting time for the first six games. I started the last six games. So I took that challenge head on and forced the coaches to look at tape side by side and they end up choosing me. So accepting the challenge, finding a way to dig deeper in the moments of challenge. I think this is a generation of college athletes that because of the option to just jump into the transfer portal, um, don't meet the challenges in ways that you and I did back when we played in, in college football. So there's that. Now, the name, image, and likeness stuff, um, I would like to have, I would like to think um, that I would be level-headed level enough um, to recognize that the, that the money I'm getting is fantastic and perhaps there could be more money someplace else. But I'm in such a great situation here at the University of Colorado. I'm not going to leave here to go chase some dollars. Again, there's always a couple sides of that coin. I've got two parents at home. Mom was a school teacher, dad was an auto mechanic. So we weren't rich, but you know there was food on the table every day. Or a, a college athlete who's got a, a single mom and he's got a couple of other siblings at home that the mom is struggling to feed, that NIL money is gonna be significant not only to him, but to taking care of his siblings back at home. So the kids who leave so they can get, you know, $20,000 with one place. Now they're leaving to get $50,000 someplace else. And then some of that money goes back home to mom. I can't fault the kids for that. I need the adults in the room to create some guidelines and some parameters so we don't have the wild, wild west that's going on currently. But I see why we did those things. I see why they make sense in certain circumstances. But we got to rein it back in a little bit. Um, but for me personally, yeah, uh, the transfer, lack of a transfer portal, made me tougher mentally, physically, made me accept the challenge of it all, but I sure could have used some of that NIL money, no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. All right, now, there's not very many times where I have a conversation and it gets, well, exotic. And, and, and that's this is one of the coolest things when I, I, I just recall getting to know all of the linebackers as a Pittsburgh kid and watching you guys and, and seeing what y'all had going on, you were into exotic animals, you know, the reptiles, like boa constrictors, pythons, like albinos, like rare lizards and, and stuff like that. Now, from what I hear, I think last time we talked, what, what you say, you, you collect rare crickets and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> from, no, I'm joking. That's a joke, yeah. But but I mean, you've been into this thing where you mess with exotics and rare animals or whatever. Like, where did that come from, man? And w w at what point were you like, "Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna build a whole back back area. I'm gonna have a whole whole area set this up, and and this is going to be something that." I do like, was it a passion? I know you had, you had a business out of it. Was it a passion? Was it a business? Was it like a hobby? What, where did it come from? Okay. So uh, everybody's familiar with Pasadena and the, and the Rose Bowl. 
So I always say I'm from Pasadena. The reality is I'm from Altadena. Altadena, it's, yeah. It's a small little city, uh, family little between the, the, the Pasadena and the mountains. Mm-hmm. So my, my backyard was full of snakes and lizards and frogs. Because uh, you lived on the mountain. Because you lived on the mountain. Uh, right. There's a pretty looseness with uh, some of the animal laws in Altadena versus Pasadena. So I had neighbors who had peacocks. I had yep. neighbors who had like backyard I got peacocks. Them. Yeah. We got peacocks. Yeah. So people had horses and, and goats in their backyard. So the animal thing was always a part of me growing up, catching okay. all those things in my backyard. Um, I wanted a snake for my 12th birthday. My mother said no snakes in the house. So she ended up buying me a Mexican red knee tarantula. Mm. It's kind of tarantula we all picture when we see a tarantula in movies. I got that for my 12th birthday. Um, Fast forward a couple years to my freshman year at the University of Colorado. Someone in the dorms has a snake for sale, uh, a boa constrictor. So uh, this lifelong passion for animals. It was there. uh, The moment that came. That was already part of me. So yeah, I saved what little money I could save from the money my mom and dad sent me. And I ended up buying this boa constrictor. Um, that was my first exotic animal. Well, then now I got to feed this thing. Uh, right. You know, uh, mice and rats aren't necessarily available everywhere. Um, so I went to a local pet store. I ended up meeting a good friend of mine, Cameron to Pedlin of Bushmaster Reptiles. Back then, he just was working at a local pet store. So I sparked up a friendship with him. He ended up inviting me to his house in Boulder, and he was breeding reptiles, particularly snakes, in his basement and selling the babies all over the country. And I thought, that's awesome. That's what I want to do. As a scholarship athlete, I can't have a job during the season. But the NCAA, they don't know what I'm doing in my, you know, in my bedroom, how I'm making animals and selling them all around the country. So that was kind of the, uh, uh, an offshoot of this entrepreneurial hustle spirit that I've always had in me. When I wanted to wear Air Jordans to my prom, my mom wasn't going to buy me those Air Jordans. So, you know, let me pack up a couple of buckets. Let me walk around the neighborhood and offer to wash people's cars so I can buy these Air Jordans. So that same kind of hustler mindset was like, you know what? I love these animals. I think they're awesome, but I can also make money with this. Um, So that's kind of where the, 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 the origins was. And then like I said, I met Cameron at the pet store that expanded my vision of things. I end up making a lot of good friends at the in the biology, the biology building at the University of Colorado. Um, and I ended up having professors who would give me, you know, free mice or free rats that were, you know, part of experiments and things like that. So I made all these connections and that really allowed that passion to move forward. I get in the NFL. I start getting a couple of NFL paychecks. So now it's turned from a hobby where I can make a little bit of money. Now I've been, I'm investing money and I'm buying animals and building up a collection to, uh, to end up having a really large business, which was called Pro Exotics Reptiles. And we sold animals all over the planet. Uh, I produced uh, several thousand baby reptiles every single year. I was one wow. of the largest commercial producers of reptiles on the globe. Wow. That is amazing. That's amazing, man. Yeah. So we produced uh, pythons and, and boas on a commercial scale, um, corn snakes, rat snakes, things like that. And I also worked with several species of lizards. By the time I you know, really disbanded the business, we had a fire in late 2000. I recall. Yeah. Um, but uh, by the time I, I, I disbanded the business, I had bred over 85 different species and subspecies of reptile. Um, I pioneered the, the breeding of several species, uh, popularized several species within the pet trade. Uh, I was the first person to breed a couple of different pattern and color mutations or to combine those pattern and color mutations. So, yeah, I was at the tops of the reptile game, just as I was at the tops of the linebacker game in the NFL. Yeah. Dang. Did you take, you know, like Shaolin, right? Like Tiger style or crane did you like take any like movements from like because if you love animals that much and you love being around them that much you take things from them like i love dogs i was a dog lover and i love big strong dogs so at one point in time i had a pit bull i had two pit bulls and an american bulldog and part of my workout it just it just 
oddly enough, it just developed and it happened. It was a moment of magic and it became a part of my, I would, I would train for 30 minutes straight on like a, on a boxing clock. And in my backyard, I would start doing my pass rush hands and my dogs would start jumping at me. So it turned into a thing where I'm like hitting my dogs. I'm back there. They jumping all at the same time. Just 30 minutes. I'm right. bang, boom, right? I'm hitting my dogs. Did you learn anything from watching the way they moved or anything that, because your pass rush, your, you it, it looked so methodical and calculated. And it was like, you know what he's about to do to him. You know he's about to do him with this spin move. And you always, they could never stop it. Like they never stopped some of the things that you did. And I always say, it's the things that you can't see while they're doing what they're doing that makes them great. It's not what you did see. You saw him spin. You saw him get around him. But whatever it is and the the footwork, what your hands did, what your hips did, what your chest did, your so whatever it is, the little things that you did and manipulated to do it that way, those are the things that people really don't see. Did you learn anything from watching them, like when they be around and stuff like that? All right, so to the dog thing, I ended up having a Kanye Corso, an Italian master. I had a Corso. five pound you know, monstrous, big, thick, muscled, athletic dog. Yeah, uh, like a bigger, more athletic version of a Rottweiler. For those who don't know what a Kanye Corso is, yeah. Um, so I ended up doing the same thing with my dogs. When I would, I would go in the backyard, yeah, it ended up being some kind of physical contest between me and my dogs. And of course, I'm working on my hand movements again, get them off me, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But the reptile stuff, um, the snakes are incredibly athletic when they strike, but they know instinctively how far away their strike is. So, you know, when coaches say, and I, you know, now that you coach high school football, I know you know this, we want to close the distance before we go tackle somebody. Close that distance before we break our feet down. So I learned how far my strike ability was. So I learned that literally from the snakes, because if you're going to handle snakes, particularly some wild caught snakes that are, you know, a little bit more prone to strike, well, how far away do I need to be to keep myself safe as I'm cleaning this cage or filling this water bowl or whatever the case may be? Now, I took that thinking and applied it to myself as a tackler. Where is my, how far is my strike distance? How close do I need to be to this guy to where I know he won't be able to make me miss? Because I was uh, athletic, because I was pretty flexible, I could tend to be a little bit further away than most people. So I think most tacklers, or, or most ball carriers were uh, thinking, oh, he's too far away. He's not going to be able to get me. No, I've calculated my strike distance down to the inch. So now I know exactly where I need to set my feet to strike you and get you where I want you to be. Um, so that was a direct offshoot of my time working with snakes. Um, and snakes will try, if you notice, when a snake wants to strike, he curls back his neck a little bit. So he's got that kind of S shape. That's an attempt to camouflage with how far I can strike. He can strike a little bit longer than you would initially think based on where he is. Same kind of thing for me as a tackler. My strike distance is going to be a little bit further than you think as a ball carrier. You think, oh, I, I got this dude set up. He's too far away. He stopped his feet. Bang. I strike. No, I haven't stopped my feet. I just got you in a position to be exactly where I want you. So uh, that's a direct offshoot of my experience and time working with reptiles. Love that. Love that. That That's, man, I love that. And we're teaching tackling right now um, in our spring ball. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a lost art. And it's funny because I teach stock the shoulder. Stock the shoulder. If you get that, your eyes on the shoulder, you stock the shoulder. And then, you know, if it, if it moves, you you stock that shoulder and then you run your eyes up and through the shoulder. If you can line up the shoulder on the chest with your eyes and get your chest on it, you absorb it with your body and you go ahead and hug him. They're like, hug? I'm like, two rules of thumb that I teach. If they can see you, you tackle them. You hug them up. If they can't see you, you blow their ass up. 
And that's it is what it is, right? So you can't miss if they don't see you. So that's that's what that's what I teach. But and speaking of, of teaching and coaching, you do a lot of teaching and coaching. Like how deep have you gotten into the coaching world? Um, do you have any aspirations? Like what what are you doing these days? What do you got going on? Uh, I've done four coaching internships in, in the NFL. Um, and they all were amazing, tremendous learning experiences. Um, I was with the Seahawks the year after they lost to the Patriots in the Super Bowl. How does Pete Carroll get his team to come back from such a, a crushing defeat? You know, so I was really interested in the psychology of what Pete Carroll was trying to do in that training camp. Um, I go to the Tennessee Titans. You know, uh, everyone was expecting them to make a big, massive leap of improvement. I think they were three and 13 the year before and yet, you know, Mike Malarkey turned them into a playoff team. How does a team or how does a coach and, and a coaching staff go about making a team believe in their potential and the, the promise that they have from a talent perspective and turn that into wins on the football field. Um, I go to the New York Jets. Todd Bowles is the head coach. People are saying this is the worst roster in 20 years of NFL history. How does Todd Bowles get that team to believe in themselves, despite what all the media is saying that they're going to be awful? Um, and then the, my last coaching internship was in San Francisco with Kyle Shanahan. Um, that dude is an absolute football genius. It was a pleasure to be around him. Um, so each of those four stops, um, I learned a tremendous amount about you know the psychology of football. How do you get a team's mindset going? How do you build a culture? You know, obviously the X's and O's and the schemes and the techniques of tackling and, and you know, keeping your eyes on the shoulder. I've learned all about that as well. Um, but I was really interested in watching these head coaches operate. I, I've always felt like I got a pretty good handle on what happens in a defensive line room or a linebacker room. So, you know, I was focused in those meetings that I was involved in, but really trying to understand the, the head coaching aspect. So um, it was a tremendous, awesome experience. When I was with the New York Jets, I was working with Kevin Green, uh, rest in peace. And Kevin's dad got sick uh, two weeks into training camp. So Kevin was gone for eight days. And uh, I, I had you basically awesome, took it over, huh? I had the awesome experience of Ty Bowles putting his hand on my shoulder and saying, hey, man, it's, they're yours. You got the whole group. So I had to take that outside linebacker group for eight days by myself, um, prepare them for a preseason game break down tape, write up player reports, report to the GM with personnel reports. It was a tremendously awesome, awesome experience. Um, so yeah, the, those internships were great. Now, uh, you've asked about what I, you know, do I plan on getting into coaching? After the fire where I lost my reptile business, I started an animal shipping company. So I started off as ship your reptiles for helping folks in the animal reptile space ship their animals. Now I've got ship your aquatics, Ship your inverse for folks who are into bugs. And I'm adding more ship yours to my business model. During the pandemic, during COVID, obviously folks were shipping a lot of stuff. Um, and if you lock animal people in their houses for months at a time, guess what? They buy more animals because they're animal people. They want to keep themselves entertained. So my business grew tremendously during COVID. And I'm faced with an opportunity that I think I need to seize this opportunity business-wise so all of my coaching aspirations, I guess, long story been short, been put on hold, been put on hold and kicked down the road a bit while I'm trying to seize this opportunity with my business. We've gone from three employees to 12 employees. Like I said, I'm adding more ship your you know, models to the business, and I'm really trying to seize this opportunity. Um, but to tie it back to football, um, all the lessons of the game, man, I use them all the time. All those things that coaches have said to me that are sometimes just cliches that other people just kind of roll their eyes at. I use those all the time in my business as I attempt to grow my business. Talking about Mike Malarkey trying to take a three and 13 team to become a playoff team. Those conversations that he had with the team are the conversations I have with my staff. We are a growing company. We've got to raise our standards and levels individually. And as a company, we need to put policies and procedures in place that didn't exist or weren't important a year ago. But as we grow the company, we've got to be able to do these kind of things. So um, I lean upon heavily my football experience and tie it to my business. And I even, I don't even say I'm the boss of the business. I'm the coach. I'm coaching everybody up so we can go out there and achieve some greatness 
and win some games and, you know, do a lot of shipping and make a lot of money. Is there a website? Where, where can people go to find what it is that you do? So you can go to allproshipping.com and that'll direct you to ship your reptiles and ship your aquatics and ship your inverts. Soon we'll be adding ship your flora for people who are in the plant hobby. Um, And we'll keep adding more ship yours as time goes along. And it's what the uniqueness of how you package up clearly and obviously um, the precious cargo that that's going out, right? Yeah. So, um, we, we don't pack the animals, you pack the animals yourself. So let's say, as an example, let's say I, I find uh, you on Facebook, LeVar, and you are breeding amazing turtles. I'm like, oh my gosh, LeVar, I got to buy some of your turtles. You got the best turtles in the world. Yep. And you can go to Ship Your Reptiles and buy all the packaging material okay. that you need. We provide the expertise and know-how to teach you how to properly package them. We sell the heat packs and the cold packs and all those different things you would need to be able to successfully execute the shipment. Then I can sell you a FedEx label because if I have gone through all the certifications with FedEx, that's now you can ship reptiles through my account. You can't show up to a FedEx facility yourself. And just ship a reptile. But because you're shipping with my company, you are now certified. So I give you all that expertise, know-how, packaging know-how, when to ship, what not to ship, all that kind of information. So FedEx is happy to give me a tremendous discount because I bring all these people to them. Uh I pass along some of that discount along to you so you can save money than you would then going directly to FedEx. And I can provide you with everything you need to be a successful fish shipper or coral shipper or reptile shipper. Um, So that's kind of my business model in a nutshell. Wow. I mean, there's something for everything, right? <laughs> yes, there is. That's just not something I would have sat down and been like today. Like, hey, babe, um, yeah, uh, give me about, yeah, give me an hour. I'm going to be sitting here trying to figure out how I'm going to ship some turtles or some coral around. or Yeah, yeah, give me a couple minutes. Yeah, I, I'll be in later. All right, okay. All right, I, I don't, that that doesn't even compute. You know what I mean? Right. So go to the internet and, and, and find me and you need help shipping your, 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 your tropical fish for your tank, shipping your koi for your pond, your corals for your reef tank, your turtles or your tortoises, whatever the case may be. I've shipped $75,000 Galapagos tortoises for zoos. Wow. I've shipped $100,000 albino alligators for, you know, uh, those kind of institutions. I've shipped uh, a, a, a woman. One of my favorite customers was this woman. She was 75 year old grandmother. She had a tortoise in her backyard from the time she was six years old. And wow. She was moving and she needed to move her tortoise. Wow. So I walked her through every step of the process. As you can imagine, this woman's had this animal for 69 years in her life. It, it wasn't a tremendously valuable animal as far as reptile. Selling, but value. But value her and, personal and, value yeah. to herself yeah. was tremendous and real. So I was more nervous about that shipment than I was for the $100,000 albino alligator. Right. Um, But yeah, I service everybody from the onesie twosie to the coral guy who's going to sell 50 pieces of coral today and another 50 pieces of coral tomorrow. I service all those people. That is amazing. You're an amazing dude, man. All right. So here's here's why I'm in this with talking to Chad Brown, former Steeler great, former Colorado Buffalo great, former Seattle Seahawk great. When it's all said and done. And they're talking about you. You're not here. But they talking about you. What is it that you want people to remember your legacy as? What do you want people to remember Chad Brown as or who or what or how? What do you want people to say about you? Chad followed his passions but found a way to help people at every step along the way. That's what I want them to say. And that, that's, that's pretty simplified. I love the game of football. I've been playing this game since I was six years old. Same time, I've done a, a football camp in the city of Pasadena for 20 plus years. Thousands of kids have now come through that camp. I get kids on the field at the Rose Bowl for this camp. We've had it at the Rose Bowl the last five years. Kids who may never have an opportunity to be on that grass. You grew up in Pasadena, you drive by the Rose Bowl, I'm going to get you on the grass. I'm going to take your vision, your your dreams, your hopes for yourself and take them to a place where they're now they're met with reality. I'm going to show you that there is a vision for yourself 
past yourself within the reptile hobby. You know, I figured out all these things about turning my hobby into a business. Now I'm going to allow you to do the same. You're, you know, you're little LeVar, you're 14 years old. You bought a couple of leopard geckos. Now you got a couple of leopard gecko babies. You want to turn this hobby into a business? Well, put your ads up on Facebook, man, and I'll help you ship those. I'll help you turn your passion into a business that works for you. Um, so along the way, yeah, I'm all, my, my vision is always kind of focused on one thing or another. Uh, but, but within that vision, I want to help you live your dream. I want to help mm -hmm. you take the next step. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had some great times on the football field but I would like to think that I can achieve greater things off the field, but using those lessons that I was taught on the field. Boom. There we go. Right. I'm humble, bro. I'm humble. And it's always, it's always an experience when I get to talk to dudes that I have admired and looked up to um, so, so much um, during the course of my, 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 le my living years. So, this one has been a, a true treat for me. I said it's kind of weird. I look older than you, and and <laughs> I was in high school watching you play. But um, but when you're great, you know that that greatness shows. You can't hide the greatness. I tell you that, boy. You can't hide that greatness. It, anyways, I appreciate having you on. It's the great Chad Brown. Everybody, if you're listening, make sure you check out the podcast. Subscribe, uh, man. Support Up On Game presents. Uh, this has been another great edition of, of Conversations with a Legend. And you said before we go, you said you are doing Ray, and you've always been in, uh, like, kind of mixed up in, in media and stuff like that. Uh, give us give us where guys can, can check out your show. If there's a podcast, whatever you promote, and let, let us know what that is as well. We'll put that up there. You've always been well-spoken and, and just super articulate in how you say things. Uh, where where can they find your show? Uh, so you can uh, find me on Twitter, Chad Brown, at Chad Brown 94. Um, I do a show in Denver on 104.3 The Fan. So just uh, search 104.3 The Fan on Google. You can get to the website. You can listen to the show live. You can you can listen to it as like a podcast version. And then during the uh, college season, I'm either doing college games or NFL games for Compass Media. They're a national radio mm -hmm. provider, very similar to, to Westward One. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm i doing football and I'm talking to the cameras and microphones all the time, in addition to running the shipping company and trying to you know help people along the way. So at some point, if you're into football, you're probably gonna come across me because I'm always somewhere talking about it. Bam. Chad Brown, y'all. Yeah, it's been up on Game much. Presents. Yes, good stuff, man. appreciate it. Thank you. Man, appreciate you too, man. All right, we'll talk to you till next time, y'all.